This week on Q&A, author and university professor Clarence Lusane discusses his latest book, The Black History of the White House. Clarence Lusane, author of The Black History of the White House. What's the picture on the cover? Well, the picture is from the late 1900s, and it's a picture of the White House Easter egg hunt. And it's significant because by the end of the 1900s, the White House was one of the few places in Washington, D.C. that was actually racially integrated. And I, we thought it would be a great, my publisher and I, we thought it would be a great picture because it shows that ongoing relationship of the White House to the black community and how that relationship has went up and down, back and forth. Uh, but at various, most of the history, the White House has been very central to what happened to African Americans. So we wanted a picture that captured that particular relationship. Your publisher, City Lights. Right. How did you find them? They found me. <laughs> Uh, initially, uh, they were looking for someone to write something about the importance of the Obama election. Uh, and of course, there are now probably hundreds of books uh, out about Obama. And so when I was approached, I didn't want to write what everyone else was writing, what this meant in terms of today's politics, what it would be, what it mean in terms of the black community. Uh, what I wanted to do was to try to find something, uh, a niche. And one of the experiences I had begun to have as I traveled not only around the U.S. but around the world, uh, because part of what I do uh, as a professor of international relations is travel a lot. Uh, in 2007, 2008, as the Obama candidacy was starting to uh, rise uh, nationally and internationally, uh, people would ask me, what did I think? Could he win? What, what would it mean to have an African-American as uh, president? But people also would ask, what is the White House? Why is it called the White House? Will Obama change the name if he becomes president? And so I realized that actually I did not have the answer to those questions. Well, I knew he wasn't going to change the name, uh, but I didn't know the history of the White House in terms of why it was called the White House and then specifically what was the history of African Americans to that icon, to that institution. So I thought I would do a little research, write a short book of about 150 pages and just kind of trace it through there. Um, what turned out to be the case was that I began to discover just fascinating uh, individuals whose mark on the presidencies and whose marks on the White House were virtually unknown. Uh, except for a few scattered stories here and there, and everyone kind of knew that George Washington and Thomas Jefferson had slaves, but most people probably didn't know that eight out of the first 12 presidents had slaves, that there were slaves inside of the White House itself. Uh, not only the White House uh, in Washington, D.C., but the president's house that George Washington lived in uh, for the first uh, uh, of his administrations uh, when he was in Philadelphia. And so this history kind of threw itself at me, and in that sense, then the book started to write itself. And so instead of it being kind of a straight up political history of the White House, it has become more of a uh, platform for presenting these fascinating individuals whose stories tell the history of the country. And each chapter opens with a long narrative about a particular individual that I thought really captured the moment, really captured that historic era uh, in broad kinds of strokes in terms of the race politics uh, and presidential politics of the period. Who was Oni? Oni. Now, this I found, I literally had never heard of, of this woman at all. Uh, all of us who grew up in the United States learned the history of the first president. We may not know the history of other presidents, but we certainly learned about George Washington, stories about him cutting down cherry, tre cherry trees, uh, stories about him never telling a lie. Uh, but we, what we had very little information about were the individuals who were actually enslaved to him. And Oni was one of the uh, nine slaves who traveled and lived with Washington 
uh, during his presidency. She wasn't back at Mount Vernon. She was actually with him uh, initially for a short period in New York, but for most of his presidency in Philadelphia, uh, she was there. And young woman, early 20s, 21, 22, and she found out in early 1796 that Martha Washington was planning to give her away as a wedding gift. During slavery, slaves were given away. And this was, of course, upsetting to her because the Washingtons had promised that when they died, they would free individuals who were enslaved to them. And so she had some hope that down the road, she would be out of this institution. But if she was going to be given away, that meant probably her whole life was going to be in slavery. So she began to make plans to escape. And as she writes, as she talks about later, uh, one evening in late spring 1796, while the Washingtons were literally sitting at their dinner table waiting for her to serve them, she went out the back door. And eventually they figured she wasn't coming and that she was gone and she had escaped. And they put out advertisements for her. They were very, very upset. Um, not that in and of itself is fascinating because when you think about it, we're talking about a young woman who basically never traveled anywhere on her own, who escapes from the most powerful person in the country, the president, who has the entire uh, government at his disposal, the military. She escapes from him. Uh, now that, if the story had just ended there, would be fascinating. Uh, but as it turns out, she escapes, she goes to uh, New Hampshire, and she's discovered accidentally by a friend of the Washingtons who informed the Washingtons that, they accident that she had accidentally ran into Oni, uh, her, her name is Oni Maria Judge, uh, they, uh, she had run into Oni on the streets. And she was very much uh, not sure why Oni was there by herself. And so she told the Washingtons, now they knew where she was at. And because George still was very image conscious, uh, and this was important because uh, George was in the, the center of the abolitionist movement in Philadelphia. Pennsylvania was, of all of the 13 states and the new states that were coming in, it was the most active against slavery. And so George had been bombarded during his entire presidency and was very sensitive to his image around slavery because he'd also said that he opposed slavery, although he didn't free any of the slaves. And so George didn't initially want to be very uh, public about going after her. And so he sent his nephew to meet with her. Uh, and she agreed. She sat down, she met with him. And then she said, uh, then the nephew said, uh, well, Oni, uh, we would like you to come back. Uh, we can work it out, uh, things got out of control, you escaped, you know, we didn't really like it, but all is basically forgiven, come back, and then uh, eventually you will be free. Uh, Oni's response was that, I'm free now. I don't really see the rationale for giving up this freedom that I escaped to, to go back into slavery. So she said no. So the nephew goes back to George Washington uh, and says, only refused to come. Uh, rather than give it up, rather than say, you know, she escaped, we don't like it, but, you know, we'll leave it alone, George decides they're going to kidnap her. And they decide to send the nephew back to organize a kidnapping, which was actually fairly common. Uh, the slave catching industry had arisen uh, during the slave period, and there were people all over the country who were willing to kidnap people, whether they were actually es escaped slaves or not, uh, and bring them back. So the nephew goes back to uh, New Hampshire, and he uh, meets with the family that, he that had initially exposed only to the Washingtons. Turns out that the family really is anti-slavery, uh, and once they find out what the nephew is up to, they delay the nephew, warn Oni, and she's able to get away. And so she's never caught. And the nephew goes back. Uh, George dies not that long afterwards, and Oni pretty much is left alone. What's the legal status of her at that time? She's an escaped slave. She's a fugitive. But could she have been arrested by a government and brought Absolutely. back? Absolutely. Now, this is what's really fascinating, again, is that
in the uh, Constitution, in the original Constitution, there was the Fugitive Slave Clause, which basically said if a slave escaped from any state and went to another state, that state is obligated to arrest that person or capture them and send them back to the other state. Uh, and in 1790, or in 1792, the Fugitive Slave Act, which was a specific law from Congress, uh, which essentially said the same thing, was signed by George Washington, probably while some of his slaves were standing around. Uh, so there were very clear federal laws uh, against uh, people that escaped from slavery. However, uh, many of the states in the North simply refused to enforce the laws. They would not uh, allow law enforcement personnel to uh, arrest people. They would uh, not arrest people who helped people escape from slavery. So there was a contention going on between the states long before the Civil War itself actually broke out. And in fact, part of the justification articulated by the states who succeeded from the Union was that there were states in the North who were not enforcing the federal laws around escaped slaves. Where did you find the Oni story? Uh, there's some information up online. And so I was able through uh, initial contacts with some individuals in Philadelphia to get information. Now, uh, the Philadelphia connection is important because uh, 1999 or so, the National Park Service decided to move the Liberty Bell from its old location to a brand new multi-million dollar pavilion. And this was going to be an uh, extremely fancy uh, new pavilion. Well, as it turns out, where they were going to build the pavilion was over the land where the house that held George Washington and his slaves during the time he was president was at that location. And in fact, it was specifically over the part of the house where the slaves were kept. So once this was discovered by historians and other activists in Philadelphia, there were protests. And there were calls for uh, honoring these individuals or remembering these individuals. You can't build this, this brand new artifice to the Liberty Bell, which is to celebrate American freedom and not acknowledge or ignore uh, what had happened at this very site. So it took a 10 year, 12 year battle, but finally the National Park Service agreed and part of the new pavilion now, which opened uh, in December 2010, is a commemorative uh, section that, uh, that notes the nine individuals who were held in slavery. So that public airing uh, of that particular issue is what gave me initially some uh, access to uh, these individuals, and only in particular. Who is Hercules? Hercules was Washington's cook, and Hercules also escaped. Now, Hercules' story is interesting because he was uh, considered one of the most famous cooks in the country at the time. Uh, he had been trained in uh, um, Europe, I believe, and just was well known just across the country as a great cook, but also as being extremely loyal to George Washington. And out of the nine individuals who were enslaved by Washington, Hercules was the only one that Washington would allow to go back and forth between Philadelphia and uh, Mount Vernon by himself without being guarded, uh, per se. And so there was a great deal of faith that Hercules was going to be there with him. And in, at the end of Washington's presidency, when he was preparing to uh, move back to Mount Vernon, uh, uh, Hercules escaped. And they never found Hercules. They thought he was in Philadelphia, but he was gone. Now, it's my sense that Hercules was probably in touch with uh, the brother of um, Sally Hemings, who were two individuals who were enslaved by Thomas Jefferson. And Sally Hemings, who a lot of uh, listeners know, uh, was the uh, African-American woman who was a slave, but who was also a mistress of Thomas uh, Jefferson. Her brother was also a cook.
he had traveled with uh, Jefferson when he had lived in Paris. He had went to cooking schools in France. And so he was a very, very uh, talented cook as well as, as like Hercules. And they were both in Philadelphia at the same time. Now, he uh, bought his freedom at one point uh, with the stipulation that Jefferson said he had to train someone else to cook before he could actually leave, uh, even though he had saved enough money to, to buy his freedom. So Hercules was in touch with him and I believe uh, probably was influenced by the fact that not only did he buy his freedom, but uh, Oni had escaped. And so, you know, there was a way in which there was a buildup of freedom uh, and, and reaching for freedom on the part of people who were enslaved to George Washington. Now, the other thing that Oni talks about uh, later on, because she gave interviews, she lived to be in her 80s. She actually lived a long life. She learned to read. She became active in her community and she did interviews. So this is where uh, some of this information is coming from. Uh, she talks about not only being influenced by the Haitian Revolution, which had happened in the early 1790s, and people who were enslaved around the world knew about the Haitian Revolution, but she was also influenced by the American Revolution. And when you think about it, the individuals who were the closest to those debates that happened at the Constitutional Convention, that happened in private sectors, that happened all over, were many individuals who were enslaved, who were serving tea, cleaning the rooms, but in and around. And they, of course, heard these debates. They heard the arguments. They heard that people were willing to risk their lives for freedom. What were the rules of slavery? I know in your book you talk about that you know, they weren't allowed to, to uh, write and, and read? Uh, it varied across the country, but most of, mostly the bottom line was that people were going to be enslaved for life. They had no citizenship rights. They had virtually no human rights. And most of the slave owners, particularly uh, in the South, but not exclusive to the, to the Deep South, uh, prohibited reading, prohibited slaves from learning to read, learning to write. Uh, other than work skills, uh, there was very little opportunity for uh, any kind of personal development uh, or even uh, professional development for many people who were enslaved. Now, as it turns out, slaves became extremely skilled because they did the work around the plantations, around the farms, but there were also a great deal of slaves in the what constituted the cities of the country uh, in that period. And that meant, for example, all of the buildings that were built, all of the large structures that were built up and down the East Coast from libraries to universities to city halls to mansions were built by slave labor uh, in many instances. And that meant people had carpentry skills, masonry skills, uh, even some architectural and design skills. So there was a whole another level of development that necessarily happened, but wasn't necessarily recognized or acknowledged. It certainly wasn't compensated. Do you have slaves in your family background? Uh, yes, but I don't know who they are. Uh, I've done uh, a great deal of genealogical research personally. Uh, but like many African Americans, there's, there are certain cutoffs. Uh, the, it wasn't until the 1870 census that uh, people who were enslaved were listed um, as individuals. Prior to that, people were just listed, if they were listed at all, as like John, who's 12, Bob, who's four. And so unless you had very specific names and very specific locations, it's very, very difficult to do that tracing. Uh, I live in Washington, D.C., and so I have, I've had access to the National Archives. And so I've spent a bit of time down at the archives going through census records. Uh, and fortunately, my family's names were unusual. So it meant I wasn't looking for 1,000 Smiths or you know, 10,000 Johnsons, uh, but Lusane was a very, uh, is a very unique kind of name. Uh, on my mother's side, her names, uh, the names in the families were unique. So I found some, um, some records, 
but then there's just the cutoff. And I've done research also, uh, like at the Daughters of the American Revolution, at the Library of Congress, because a lot of information is in diaries, for example. And I found the diary, uh, this had to be 20 years ago, of the family's name, which were the family that owned my family in Alabama. And there was a diary that went back to like about the 1500s. And in that, there were some references to individuals who were enslaved but it's very difficult to connect all of those dots. Where's your, where were you born? I was born in Detroit. My mother is from Alabama and my father's from Louisiana. And the, the name Lusane is what? It's a uh, Creole name. Uh, you see it a lot kind of in the Texas, Louisiana, Georgia, Mississippi uh, area. Uh, and there are not a lot of Lusanes. For many years, I, whenever I would travel, I would look in phone books to see if there were uh, Lusanes that I could, could trace. Uh, and there weren't a lot. Uh, but over the last seven or eight years or so, uh, in part because of the internet, uh, I've had more contact with people who are named Lusanes, and some of us have been able to find some uh, familiar connections. You did your undergrad work where? At Wayne State. Uh, University in Detroit. of Detroit. What did you study? Uh, communications, uh, radio, TV, and film. Then what was next? And then uh, I spent a number of years uh, working uh, mostly as a journalist, uh, covering international issues. Uh, and then eventually I ended up working on Capitol Hill. I worked on the Hill for about eight years. Walter Front Roy? Uh, uh, for Walter Front Roy, the uh, DC delegate for two years. Uh, and then for about five or six years for what was called the Democratic Study Group. And that was the main office on Capitol Hill that did research for House Democrats. And so a lot of the posters and uh, uh, big billboard, billboards that you would see on the House floor, those are the kind of things that I worked on. Uh, however, 1994, the Republicans took over, took control of Congress, uh, Newt Gingrich and, and and the Republicans. And one of the first things they did when they actually came into office in January, uh, they defunded a number of organizations, uh, including the Democratic Study Group that I work for. So they literally, although the office had been there close to 40 years, virtually overnight, the uh, office was closed down. Where'd you get your PhD? Uh, from Howard University. What year did you get it? In 1997. And how long have you been teaching at American? Now going on close to 15 years. Who was Paul Jennings? Paul Jennings. Uh, another one of my favorite uh, uh, characters, uh, and, and maybe we shouldn't call them characters, uh, but another one of the individuals who pops out of the research. Uh, Paul Jennings was enslaved to the Madisons, to James and Dolly Madison. Uh, and by the time he was 10 years old, he was working at the White House. Now, this turned out to be fortuitous because he happened to be there in 1814 when the White House was burnt down, when the British invaded and uh, burnt the city down, including uh, much of what was in the White House. And he was there literally on that day when further down the road, the British were uh, burning and looting and headed towards the White House. And the White House staff, both slave and unslave, were uh, in a very hectic kind of manner trying to grab whatever they could to get out before uh, the British actually got to the front door. And so we know this story because in 1865, Paul Jennings wrote a memoir, a very short one, but one of the first, if not the first, memoir of someone who actually worked in the White House. And he tells that story. He tells the story of being at the bedside when James Madison died. He also tells the story how Dolly Madison reneged on the deal that he was supposed to be freed after James Madison passed. And for primarily economic reasons, uh, Dolly didn't free him immediately. And so he uh, had to work and earn enough to kind of buy his freedom uh, a few years later. But let me, at, at one thing, I, because of you, I got on the internet and found the memoir, which is available to anybody that wants to see it. And right. it is short, but the, a number of stories popped out of there, including the 
did he really, at the end of Dolly Madison's life, end up helping her pay her bills? Yeah, as, as he talks about, uh, she fell on very hard times. Uh, it's, it's very different from the day when someone leaves the presidency. They're pretty much guaranteed, you know, somewhat security for the rest of their life. Uh, but that really wasn't the case uh, during that period. And so her friends and her family uh, basically abandoned her. And so although she had, she did him wrong, uh, he felt some compassion, uh, some human compassion. And so as he writes in, in his memoirs, he would often visit her, he would bring her food, uh, probably give her some money when he had it. And so he looked after her, you know, because by that period, by the late, by the mid 1840s or so, uh, you know, Dolly Madison was pretty, uh, pretty up there in age. And so and she pretty much had no one to look after her. And so uh, he writes that he did what he could uh, with what he had. And he, he actually became um, somewhat successful once he bought his freedom. He stayed in Washington, D.C. He ended up getting a government job, uh, which he eventually retired for, from in the uh, 1860s. Now, what he doesn't talk about in his memoir is his central role in an escape, a big, a gigantic slave escape attempt uh, in 1848. Uh, and this was in the spring of 1848 when the city was very uh, bustling with parties celebrating a lot of the revolutions that were happening in Europe. Now, this was a big contradiction, of course, that while people were celebrating freedom in Europe, they were enslaving people in the United States. But this had been uh, an ongoing kind of week of parties. And as it turns out, that was the week that uh, Jennings and two other freed African Americans had been part of this plan to bring a boat down to the docks, down to the wharf, and people in the area who were enslaved, uh, who wanted to be part of this, would come down to the boat on a Saturday night uh, in ones and twos and then sneak onto the boat. And it wasn't unusual on Saturday nights to see African Americans walking around because that was generally the only night that uh, people who were enslaved had some time off. So seeing them walking around wasn't uh, unusual. Uh, and the plan worked. Uh, about close to 80 people got on the boat and then the boat took off. And the, pl the idea was that they would have such a head start by the time it was realized on Sunday that people had escaped, they could get away. Uh, they ran into two problems. One is that they hit bad weather and it forced the boat to pull to the side and they were, they, they were gonna be forced to wait for the weather to get better, uh, which was not still gonna be, it was still wasn't gonna be a problem uh, as long as no one knew where they were at. However, back in Washington, uh, someone betrayed them who knew about the plan and when the posse gathered uh, to go after him, which initially thought people had escaped on foot and were heading north, uh, this individual said, no, they're in a boat headed south. This is where they went. So they got into a faster boat. Uh, they caught up with the people who had escaped and everybody was captured and then brought back to Washington, D.C. Now, as it turns out, Paul was not on the boat, probably because he was free and had freedom of movement, so he didn't need to be on the boat, uh, or who knows. Uh, but in any case, he wasn't on the boat, but also he was never exposed. And so he became active in trying to get freedom for people who were uh, caught, but no one ever came forward and said, well, you know, this guy actually was who contacted the captains and had the boat down there. Maybe he should be arrested as well. Uh, and in fact, it wasn't discovered until after he died when research into that particular incident uncovered his role. The story about Paul Jennings and Daniel Webster. Uh, yeah, Paul Jennings eventually uh, either uh, worked out a deal with Daniel Webster, uh, but in some way became uh, left Dolly Madison's enslavement and became a slave to uh, Webster, but for a relatively short period uh, because Webster essentially was working it out with him to get his freedom. Um, and Webster, of course, would be a, a key individual uh, in the period around uh, issues of challenging slavery and issues of uh, leading up to the Civil War. At, 
at the height of the numbers, how many slaves were there in uh, the United States? Uh, four million. Uh, there were millions. And how many non-slaves were there in the United States at that time? Uh, probably about 200,000 or so, maybe all well, I, 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 I didn't ask the question right. Were there, what was it, 40 percent of the country was slaves at then, and then the other would be whites? Oh, you mean in terms yeah, of whites, how many right. whites were there? Uh, it, it varied. Um, overall, it, uh, African Americans were probably about 30, 40 percent of the country. But depending on where you were at, if you were in some states, South Carolina, Mississippi for sure, likely North Carolina, likely Alabama, slaves were a majority of the population. How much, I know this is over a period of time, but say in the 1800 area, how much was a slave worth to be, to, and when you had to buy your freedom, what did it cost a slave? Oh, good question. Uh, it seemed to have varied because a great deal of it depended on how much had been invested in the individual, the age of the individual. There was different prices for men versus women. Uh, for example, children uh, were a different price. And so it could vary from a couple of hundred to a couple of thousand, which was an exorbitant amount. Uh, but it depended if it was someone who was extremely skilled, who was very young, who had 40 or 50 years ahead of them, uh, they could potentially go for, for a high price. And then there were issues of whether or not you took the whole family or you took part of the family. Uh, all those kind of came into play uh, over these negotiations around buying and selling uh, of individuals. Who was Peter? Peter was one of the carpenters who worked on the White House. Uh, what we know from the records is that there were five uh, black carpenters who worked on the White House and uh, for some period also worked on building the Capitol. The, the, the reason George Washington was not in Washington, D.C. was because it didn't exist at the time. Uh, there was a fierce negotiation uh, right after the uh, Constitution was ratified and the decision uh, and the debate over where to have the seat of government. Uh, the South wanted to have the seat in the South and the North uh, resisted that. So a compromise was worked out that for the 10 year period that it was estimated that it would take to build this brand new city. Uh, the new government would not be in one of the old cities, it would be a brand new uh, city be, to be built, that the government could be in Pennsylvania. But at the end of that 10 year period, in, at 1800, it would come back to this new city, which was Washington, D.C. And this was land that was ceded by Maryland and Virginia uh, at the time. And uh, it was jungle. It was trees and rocks, and that was it. And so that whole area, this, this, this whole area had to be clean. And the trees had to be cut down, they had to be dragged away, there had to be uh, roads had to be paved and buildings had to be built. And so a lot of that labor ended up being slave labor, which was not unusual at the time because of all the major projects that were building the country in that period, slave labor was involved. Now, what we have not focused on in terms of our own historical acknowledgement, though, is that slave labor in the building of the White House and in the building of the Capitol these institutions that were icons of liberty and freedom uh, also carry with them uh, this history as well. And it, that's part of what I was trying to do with uh, bringing that history out. This is a thick 600 page book. And you said you started out thinking you're going to write a small book. Right. And it's a paperback and City Lights only publishes paperbacks. How's it done? Uh, we're on the third printing. Uh, we're we were uh, uh, a bit surprised uh, at the, what has been uh, essentially kind of a success of the book. Uh, City Lights was actually great for me to publish with. Uh, I started off with no page limit. Um, you know, I've written other books, and one of the things you negotiate from the very beginning with uh, publishers uh, is the question of page length, because they're figuring out 
what their costs are, how to design the book, and all of that. So you you know you have to write 250 pages or 300 pages. Uh, City Light says write it till it's finished, and I said fine. <laughs> uh, I had no idea though it was literally going to get, uh, grow like it did. But again, as the story started to emerge, then it became impossible for me not to include Oni, or to include Peter, or to include Paul Jennings. And even with all of the individuals I've included, now as I've given talks, particularly around Washington, D.C., I'm often approached by people who say, well, you know, my uncle used to be a barber at the White House, or my grandmother used to work upstairs at the White House because these stories have not been told. And as we think about the history of the presidencies, we don't think of the particular relationship between the president's residence and how that and the White House as a global icon. People all over the world know the White House if they know no other structure in the United States at all. Probably Statue of Liberty is the only other equivalent uh, uh, physical icon. Uh, people know the White House, but we don't know the White House history. Here's what you say, page 19 of the book. I'm going to read the paragraph. U.S. history is taught and for the most part learned through filters. In everything from school books and movies to oral traditions, historical markers, and museums, we are presented with narratives of the nation's history and evolution. For generations, the dominant stories have validated a view that overly centralizes the experiences, lives, and issues of privileged white male Americans and silences the voice, voices of others. It has been as though some have an entitlement to historic representation and everyone else does not. When did you reach that conclusion? Well, that conclusion I reached a long time ago. Uh, That's what I mean, though. When, a long time ago, did you reach that conclusion? Well, I am a child of the 60s, uh, meaning that I was born in uh, 1953, and I was relatively young when the uh, uh, real kind of spark of activism around civil rights and around black power issues uh, emerged. but I was old enough to be affected by it and old enough to be uh, engaged, meaning that there were, there were in Detroit, which had had several riots in 1967, 1968, uh, many of whom were literally uh, close to, or in my neighborhood, uh, it was impossible not to be affected. Fortunately, what this meant for me was that by the time I was 14, 15, I was active in community groups, community organizations. Uh, part of the way the city responded to these riots was to attempt to get a lot of the young folks who were like my age into more socially active and socially productive kind of endeavors. And so in that sense, I was uh, probably rescued uh, to some degree from not being active around these different issues. And so that's where my own kind of ideas about social justice and, uh, and beginning to look at American history, look at American politics in a particular kind of way evolved. There were 43 people killed in that July of 1967. What impact did that have on you? Do you remember it? Oh, I remember it vividly. The 1967 riot, uh, in part, began a few blocks from my, my house. And my mother and my father and I and my sisters, we had been in Canada. It started on a Saturday night, and we had spent all day Saturday uh, in Canada. Often people in Detroit cross the bridge and go fishing. And when we got back, there was a full-blown riot going on. And it was a very, very hot evening. I was probably about 12 or so then. Uh, and nobody was inside. And at one point, my mother and my sister and I walked down a couple of blocks to this sort of main intersection uh, where there were just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. And uh, after being there for a while, a car drove up and uh, two white men got out and fired at the corner. They lifted a shotgun and fired. 
and everyone on the corner was hit. It was probably about 20 people. Uh, everybody was hit except for me. My mother was shot, my sister was shot. Um, some of the injuries were more serious than others, um, but everybody was, you know, people were bleeding. And it was, of course, panic. So I ran and got my father. Uh, we got the car, we came back, and we loaded it up with four or five people that we could fit in the car, including my mother and sister, uh, and took people to the hospital. Uh, Fortunately, my, the injuries to my mother and sister were not very, very serious. Uh, my mother's injuries were a little more, and so she was in the hospital for a few days. My sister basically kind of overnight. But that was my uh, experience. And so it was you know, impossible for me not to uh, be uh, very conscious about something's going on in society. I can't well, ignore what's going on around me. What impact did it have on you though? It made me uh, an activist. And, and, it, and I think it also made me uh, reflective because it made me try to begin to seek answers to why violence existed, why racism existed, why poverty existed. Uh, but again, it was in a period where these were the kinds of issues that were being raised in school, they were being raised in the church that we went to, they were being raised in the community center that uh, I used to go to. So all around me there were uh, uh, discussions going on about American society. What was that race riot all about? Uh, that, uh, the immediate spark of it, uh, similar to uh, riots, for example, that we're seeing in London, uh, were the very acrimonious relationship between the police and the black community, where there was a long history of indiscriminate shootings, beatings, uh, arrest of people for trivial reasons. Uh, so there was a long history of basically a virtually all white police force and an all black community. Did you know any of the 43 that were killed? No, I didn't. None of that group that these two white men shot there with you, the 20 people were died? Uh, nobody died. Did they ever find out who the two men were? No, not at all, not at all. And you know, it was, it was complete chaos. You know, we got to the hospital, hundreds of people were there who were injured, uh, you know, and, and it was, you know, the kind of situation that you know, they they investigated the homicides that happened. I'm not sure how many of those they ever saw, but just on the just wide range of injuries that happened, you know, nothing was ever followed up on that. You said you went to Wayne State. Uh, what kind of a family did you grow up in? How much education did your parents have? Uh, my f mother and father were both working class. My mother uh, went as far as the fifth grade. My father as far as the eighth grade. Uh, but my mother always had plans for us to finish high school and go to university. She was originally from Alabama. She came up during that period when uh, several million African Americans uh, came up between the two wars. And she came up to Detroit, which was, you know, there were factories, there were jobs, uh, and met my father. And, uh, you know, they were both working class, but my mother very, very, very much was you know, you guys have to go to school, you have to finish, don't get in trouble. How many in the, uh, how many in the family? Uh, not two sisters, one older and one younger. Um, and, you know, our neighborhood was very lower working class. Um, uh, not the worst, but far, far from being uh, the best. Um, and I think probably because my mother was just so, uh, determined, you know, it kept me from engaging in activities that probably were not going to be good uh, for my long-term future, uh, some of which I engaged in anyway, she never found out about. But uh, for the most part, you know, she, she really was uh, very education focused. And so when I graduated from junior high school, I ended up going to a uh, school in Detroit called Cass Tech, which at the time was rated in like the top 10 schools in the country. And she was very, very uh, proud of that. 
but it really was her just determined effort to make sure we did our homework. You know, she went to school, talked to our teachers. So even though she herself uh, was not extremely highly educated, she valued education. What was the work that your parents did, the actual work? Uh, my father worked at a factory for a while, uh, and then he stopped doing that. Um, some, during some periods, he basically ran illegal uh, activities. He would run uh, what we call after-hour joints. And so he would have these uh, places where people would come and they would buy drinks and they would gamble, that, those kind of activities. No, nothing kind of hardcore, but you know, those kind of activities. Uh, my mother uh, worked uh, in a laundry uh, for about 25 years. Are they alive? No, they both have passed. Let me read uh, this pair. I want to read two paragraphs. It'll take just a little bit of time, but I want to contrast these two paragraphs that you have in this book. Okay. The first one is a quote from Pat Buchanan on the Rachel Maddow Show, July 16, 2009. Well, I think, this is Pat Buchanan. Well, I think white men were 100% of the people that wrote the Constitution, 100% of the people that signed the Declaration of Independence, 100% of the people who died at Gettysburg and Vicksburg, probably close to 100% of the people who died at Normandy. This has been a country built basically by white folks. I'm going to read the other one in a second. Why did you put that in the book? Because I think that is a very common view. Uh, Pat Buchanan says it in kind of his uh, uh, very uh, bold way. But uh, for many people around the country, uh, that probably is a common view. And I would argue that some of what we're witnessing in terms of the uh, growth of the Tea Party, the uh, resistance to Obama on a, on a lot of different levels is reflecting some of the demographic changes that are going on in the country that counter what many people feel has been a history of uh, whites. And that, that the browning of the country and people coming from Asia, people coming from Africa, coming from the Caribbean is a cultural uh, rupture. Uh, but in fact, uh, the long, long history of the country has always been one of multiple people from all over the world. Then there's a second quote. First of all, I need to ask you, what is Walker's appeal? Uh, David Walker was an uh, advocate. Uh, in the 1830s, and a uh, free black man who wrote a pamphlet called David Walker's Appeal, which essentially called for slaves to uprise. And he, t he had no tolerance for the sort of gradual evolution of the end of slavery. He saw, sla he condemned slavery in the harshest terms, and he issued a pamphlet, or wrote a pamphlet. And the pamphlet was distributed in the South. It actually became illegal to have a copy of the pamphlet. All right, let me read this quote. Uh, you, um, you quote this. The 76-page pamphlet advocated that blacks revolt against their white enslavers and call for nothing short of full liberation and equality for African Americans, enslaved and free. The pamphlet also argued against colonization. Let no man of us budge one step and let slaveholders come to beat us from our country. America is more our country than it is the whites. We have enriched it with our blood and tears. The greatest riches in all America have risen from our blood and tears, and will they drive us from our property and homes, which we have earned with our blood? There's quite a difference in that view, those two views. Yeah, well, the very first quote in the book, and this has been something with me for much of my life, is, a line from a Langston Hughes poem, very simple, it says, I too am America. Very straightforward. And what he's saying, as David Walker writes, but as millions of African Americans have said for hundreds of years, this has been, this project that we call America has been a collaborative one. Some of that collaboration has been forced but you cannot honestly trace the hit history of this country without including the indigenous people who were here, the Africans who were brought over, the Asians who came over from China, 
people from all around the world who at every step along the way built the political, economic, social, and cultural systems that we live under. What we haven't done is always acknowledge those contributions and value those contributions. Who is Elizabeth Keckley? Another fascinating woman. Uh, Elizabeth, uh, turns out, uh, ended up being the best friend of Mary Lincoln. Now, Elizabeth's own history is one of just uh, amazing serendipitous encounters. She, for example, uh, this is a black woman who uh, grew up in Missouri, uh, who was enslaved and eventually was able to buy her freedom. She developed uh, uh, very good skills as a seamstress and as a dressmaker. Uh, just to give kind of a sense of her historic encounters, the individual who she was enslaved to one of the, uh, was one of the lawyers who argued the Dred Scott decision before the Supreme Court, uh, the 1857 Dred Scott decision, the most important Supreme Court ruling prior to the Civil War regarding slavery. The Dred Scott decision basically said slavery can exist anywhere in the country, which upset what had been this kind of delicate balance going back to the 1820s of bringing in one slave state with one free state to try to dampen down the tensions between the country, the, within the country, but the tensions were still growing. The Dred Scott decision, which was Dred Scott was, and his wife were two individuals who had spent time in a free state and then they argued that they should be free, that that uh, presence and that time they spent in a free state uh, should give them liberation. The court has said absolutely not. And in fact, uh, and this is a famous quote, that blacks have no rights that whites are bound to respect. The person who argued before the Supreme Court uh, against the Dred Scotts was one of, the, one of those lawyers was the person who had owned Elizabeth Keckley. So that's just kind of what the history she just sort of encountered. There's, there's a lot more to the story about Elizabeth Keckley, but there's part of this I want you to, because we don't have a whole lot of time, right. that Mary Lincoln also got in financial trouble and yeah. Elizabeth Keckley, and she wasn't a slave and right. she wasn't on the White House payroll, but she was a friend, ended up helping her? Right. Elizabeth Keckley was an independent businesswoman and her business was making dresses. And as it turns out, she left Missouri, came to Washington, D.C., and by circumstance, she ended up becoming the dressmaker for Mary Lincoln, but also her confidant and her friend. And so uh, Elizabeth spent a great deal of time at the White House just out of her work, but also just out of her closeness to Mary, who was actually alienated from many of the people in Washington, D.C., uh, just out of her personality and, and, and her background. And uh, Elizabeth also got to know Abraham Lincoln. And so she had a number of discussions and engagements with, uh, with them over the years. Uh, after Lincoln was killed, uh, Mary uh, left Washington, D.C., uh, but she was in debt. And in fact, she was in debt while Lincoln was president, and he more or less did not know the degree to which she had gotten in debt over buying dresses and, and other purchases. And so at one point, her and Elizabeth come up with a plan to secretly sell her dresses uh, in New York City. Uh, but the plan doesn't go that well. There's not a great market for uh, for her dresses, so it helps some, but it doesn't help uh, totally. Before we run out of time, Sunday, August the 28th, the, what is it, the 48th anniversary of the I Have a Dream speech, and the day they unveil the Martin Luther King statue on the mall. What's it mean? It means there's another step forward in the country reconciling its history. And I say that because statues uh, are important uh, symbols of recognition. And what this says is that we're at a point where we're going to recognize the contributions of Martin Luther King, who gave his life for making sure that this country lived up to its stated ideas.
And this was to include poor people, it was to include black people, it was to include poor whites. People across the board who had been excluded. I think too often the focus on Martin Luther King only stops at the efforts around ending segregation. But he completely uh, had a broader vision that included uh, people across the spectrum who he felt were marginalized, who were ostracized, who were not being included uh, in the American dream. And so this uh, statue gives another opportunity for his ideas to be discussed um, and to be uh, lived. So, since this, how long has this book been out? Since uh, December 2010. The Black History of the White House. Uh, what's the most surprising thing or interesting thing that a white person who's read this book has said to you? Well, uh, I think there were, uh, I've given many, many talks. Uh, I'll tell you two things, two things. Uh, one is uh, a talk I gave at the White House. And I was, uh, very surprised at how emotional it was because there were a lot of young black people who were working at the White House, a lot of older young, older black people, uh, and a lot of whites who had no idea of this history and that Obama is a, another stage in this history. And so w as I went through the presentation and talked about the different individuals, uh, people felt very, very emotionally attached. And that was just really a surprise to me because uh, I've talked to people all over the country. Uh, in terms of what people have come up to me and said, uh, it's mostly been in the vein of, I had no idea. I have had no idea whatsoever. Did you have an idea? I did not. I will be very honest. I spent, I've spent many years writing about black politics and black history. I would say 80% of this book uh, was new to me. I literally had not heard of uh, almost all of these individuals uh, as I'm kind of going through this history. And then it, in many ways, I went back and looked at some of the things I wrote before. Uh, before we run completely out of time, when did you get married? Uh, in December 2007. How many children do you have? One. What's his or her name? His name is Ellington. Where did you meet your wife? Here in Washington, D.C. Is Ellington named after Duke? Uh, he is, and it's to honor Duke Ellington, but also my wife and I met at a jazz concert, and so we thought that that would be important. But Duke Ellington is such a positive symbol of, of Washington, D.C. We wanted to, to honor him. Clarence Lusane, author of The Black History of the White House, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much. For a DVD copy of this program, call 1-877-662-7726. For free transcripts, or to give us your comments about this program, visit us at qna.org. Q&A programs are also available as C-SPAN podcasts.